When learning about the history of our people in school, one of the images imprinted on our young minds was that of the cruel eviction scenes. Images that were depicted all too vividly in drawings and paintings, and in later times in photographs reproduced in school texts. To our young minds, those who carried out those shameful acts in meeting out such harsh treatment must have been, well, unfeeling brutes, devoid of humanity. Inevitably, of course, we wondered what happened to poor people who were the victims of such diabolical treatment. The great writer and novelist from County Longford, Maria Edgeworth, wrote about the system that caused such oppression of Irish tenants. Her book, published in 1800, had the carefully chosen title Castle Rackrent. In this work and other writings, Mariah highlighted the dissipated lifestyle of the landlords who lived in their castles or the big house while rack-renting their poor tenants. Many were thrown off their small holdings and their houses demolished. In 1841, the population of Ireland was over 8 million and the pressure on land was such that millions lived a precarious existence trying to survive. The Great Famine of 1845 to 1850 and beyond saw one million die and a million emigrate. The effect of such a huge leap in emigration was regarded as an epidemic. Disease was rampant, and at the peak of the Great Hunger in 1847, the fever was carried on board overcrowded ships so that many died before they reached the shores of America. For thousands of those who starved and could pay no rent, they were evicted. It brought about a period of unparalleled brutality. There are no photos of evictions from the famine times, but this one, taken some years later, shows the destitute state of a Kerry family outside their demolished home. It's estimated that between a quarter of a million and 700,000 people were left homeless. The starving and demoralized victims were incapable of resistance. People never knew when the landlord's agent would deliver a notice to quit. In other words, a notice of eviction. This was a cold and heartless document, and this 1869 notice to quit was delivered to the Coyle family in Donegal. It was from none other than the despised landlord, Lord Leitrim. His agent states on his lordship's behalf, I hereby give you notice to quit and deliver up to me or his bailiff that part of the lands with houses thereon and failure to do so, the landlord, Lord Leitrim, will proceed to recover the possession and double the yearly value thereof and all costs attending such a recovery. A legacy of bitterness resulted, of course, both in Ireland and among Irish emigrants in the United States. People lived in fear of being evicted, and Longford poet and playwright Padre Colum wrote a poem called Spadesman that has these lines. One said these tenants were so racked, 
with rental field on bog on shore, there was no season but they saw the bailiff's shadow on the door. Well, little did I know in my youth that my family was one of those very families so harshly dealt with through eviction. And it wasn't until my late father told me in my mid-thirties what had happened to them just after the famine. It was a time when hunger, eviction and emigration combined to create a cataclysmic change in Irish society. One day, in the mid-1970s, I sat my father down to talk about the family and to get some information for the family tree. He was a quiet-spoken man, but he had a keen memory, and soon after he started talking, he casually mentioned that his grandparents, his O'Hara grandparents, who were married in 1846, they had been evicted. <laughs> this was news to me, of course, so I listened carefully as he continued. He wasn't sure about the exact date of the eviction, but said that the children were small at the time. And note that my grandparents were married in 1846, early on in the famine. I later learned that the landlord's agent had raised the rent three times between the years 1850 and 1854. And that's when the sad event took place, and several other families were evicted at the same time. We think this is the location of the O'Hara family holding at the time of the eviction in the townland of Clunach, about a mile from Drumlish village. The picture shows some young O'Hara family members who were learning about their eviction story for the first time. My father went on to say that the family house was knocked down in the eviction. So, what were they to do? Well, the O'Hara family and some of their neighbours took every stone of the demolished house and carted the whole lot to another plot of ground about a half mile away and nearer Drumlish. In no time at all, another house was built. That house is still there today in Lochan, just off the Longford Road into Drumlish. It's in a derelict state, of course, but still largely intact. My cousin lives on that piece of land in a new house he built several years ago. I asked my father how the eviction affected the family. He paused briefly and said, I don't think they ever got over it. Well, they got over it to this extent anyway, in that they got a holding of some ten acres or so and built a house. But I still think of what it must have been like for my great-grandparents and their small children. My late father did not add much to their story, I'm afraid, but I could do some digging myself and find out what it was like for others and how they were affected by such an awful experience. Around the time of the O'Hara family's eviction, a 12-year-old Tipperary boy, William Butler, was brought by his father to witness an eviction scene. It left a deep impression on his young mind. This is what he recalled in later life. At this time, he wrote, the weakening effects of the famine were still painfully evident in the people and the spirit of opposition which in after years was to become so strong was not yet in being. The sheriff, a strong body of police, and above all, the crowbar brigade, a group of the lowest and most debauched ruffians, were present. At a signal from the sheriff, the work began. The miserable inmates of the cabins were dragged out upon the road, the thatched roofs were torn down, and the earthen walls battered in by crowbars. The screaming women, the half-naked children, the paralyzed grandmother, and the tottering grandfather were hauled out.
he said that if he had had a gun at the time, he would have fired on, quote, that crowd of villains as they ply their trade. Butler's horror at what he had seen as a boy was shared by readers of newspapers and magazines of the time at home and abroad, and the reports, with their shockingly explicit illustrations, brought the shame of what was happening in Ireland to the notice of the world. One must ask, who were these men who ordered such appalling acts to be carried out? I should point out, of course, that this photo is from a much later time, but it plainly shows what sort of people were involved in wrecking a home. Well, they are clearly seen here, or we can make the assumption that they are here. The bailiff, the agent, the middleman, they're there, perhaps, amongst all those officials supported by the laws of the Crown to do such wretched deeds. I wanted to learn something about the landlord and the agent responsible for evicting our people from the town land of Clonach. Well, I was fortunate to find vital information in the famous publication A Short History of the Land War in Drumlish. This 1892 publication dealt with later evictions in 1881, but its author, the remarkable Father Tom Conifrey, parish priest of Drumlish at the time, gave an account of those earlier evictions of the 1850s that involved the O'Hara family. Tom Conifrey was born in 1837, just outside Drumlish, and so knew the area very well. From him I learned that the absentee landlord was Mary Ann Mitchell. When the O'Haras occupied their holding in Clunach, Miss Mitchell was unmarried. She later moved to England, where she met and married Henry Douglas. The Longford property was then held in both their names. Well, they were absentee landlords and lived in England. They needed an agent to manage their property and collect the rents. That agent was one John Dias, himself from a family of landlords from Athboy, County Meath. I learned quite a lot about him from Father Conifrey's book. I also continued with my researches and was lucky to learn a bit more about the Dias family from a distant relative of theirs. His name is Eamon Dias, a member of a poorer branch of that family who lives in London. He said of his Irish Dias family, uh, they never prospered, having subsequently married into Roman Catholicism. Eamon said, those bearing the name from Meath were stereotypical 19th century Irish landlords who also acted as agents for absentee landlords. Uh, they were not very popular in the area, to say the least. He added that the infamy of that family name lives right up to his own time in County Meath. Throughout the 19th century, various Dias men, acting as agents for landlords, were targets for assassination and reports of attempts on their lives appeared in Irish and English newspapers. This one is from the Times of London on the 27th of September, 1860. It began. Mr. Dias was sitting beside his coachman, whether driving or not I cannot say, the inside of the vehicle being occupied by a portion of the family, and when within a short distance of his own house, a shot was fired from behind the hedge. Fortunately, without seriously wounding either Mr. Dias or the coachman. This is, I understand, either the third or fourth time that the life of Mr. Dias has been attempted. Conifrey provides us with plenty of detail on John Dias, who enriched himself not only at the expense of the tenants, but of his landlord as well. When he died, 
Tom Conifrey said there were no tears shed for him. Dias didn't meet the fate of a neighbouring landlord, Lord Leitrim. It must be said that the family that grabbed the O'Hara farm became very unpopular with their neighbours, and my father said they were forced to leave the country. Speaking of which, in 1862, a man and his wife from near Drumlish were murdered in a dispute to do with a field that was claimed by relations of theirs. This report appeared in the 25th of April 1864 edition of the Irish Times and referred to, quote, the fate that befell Corrigan in the county Longford, that is, be shot dead. The report reads, Agrarianism in Leitrim. A threatening notice was found posted on the morning of the 19th on the roadside in the townland of Anshana, giving general warning in the most profane and blasphemous terms to the farming class of the county that any man who took any of the farms from which tenants were recently evicted would most certainly meet the fate which befell Corrigan in the county Longford, that is, be shot dead. From our correspondent. As for my great grandparents and their large family, well, all but the youngest emigrated to America. The youngest was John, and he married Anne Rogers, one of the family that built the mill in Drumlish 200 years ago. She was a school teacher in Duroc near Drumlish. Anne and John's oldest son was James O'Hara, my father. In time, of course, ownership of land passed from an alien landlordism to a land-hungry people. In Padre Cullum's play, The Land, the farmer Murta Cosker considers what has been won for his sons and states. Their manhood was spared the shame that our manhood knew, standing in the rain with our hats off to let the landlord, I or a landlord's dog boy, pass the way. The O'Haras must have experienced something similar, and perhaps even worse, when they were evicted by the agent and his emergency men, those heavies hired to do the dirty work, ejecting families who were struggling with landlords and the law the law that would leave a rich man poor and a poor man broken. But the O'Haras survived. <laughs>